Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Gibson, and this is Caitlin McFarland, and we are the co-executive directors of ATX Television Festival. And we're so excited that you are here with us for our first live stream Q&A um, <laughs> that is our lead in to next week's ATX TV from the couch, which will be happening June 5th through 7th right here on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe now and you will get all the updates. You can also go to our website, atxfestival.com um, and you can register there and get all the information for what's happening next weekend. It's going to be three days full of screenings and panels. <laughs> there, I was about to say, I mean, we're going to be talking lots of TV. We're going to have reunions with the Scrubs cast. We're going to have reunions from Justified and Psych. We're going to have um, conversations about current shows like The Bull Type and Amsterdam. We are going to show some premiere clips of things. First looks. First Exclusive looks. first looks, guys. Uh, and lots of industry conversations. So please uh, register and tune in. But tonight, we are kicking it off. We're so excited with the CW's DC's Stargirl um, that just premiered last week. And we saw this pilot a couple weeks ago, fell in love immediately, knew it was something we wanted to be part of uh, these events that we're doing. And so we're excited that this is the kickoff. Our very first one right ahead of episode two, which airs tonight. So you should be tuning in. But we just wanted to thank the CW. They've been great partners to us. Um, doing this. We'll also have a little bit of Star Girl at the festival next week, as well as Nancy Drew. So there will be lots of CW love for you there. But with that, we'll get it started with uh, your moderator, Laura Prudom from IGN. Come on in, Laura. Hi, guys. Nice to see you. You have too. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We're going to let you take it away. Bye-bye. Amazing. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Prudham, the uh, editorial manager at IGN, and it is my extreme pleasure to be talking to the cast and creator of show, uh, Stargirl tonight. Uh, we'll kick things off with creator and showrunner Jeff Johns. Hey, Laura. Hi, Jeff. How, you How are you? Very well. How In about sunny you? Sunny London. Good, good. Yes, yes, sunny London, 11 p.m., not sunny right now. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, also want to introduce Stargirl herself, Breck Bassinger. Hello, guys. Hi, Breck. Hey, Breck. Hi. Hi. Uh, Yvette Monreal, who plays Yolanda Montez, a.k.a. Wildcat. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Angelica Washington, who plays Beth Chapel, a.k.a. Dr. Midnight. Hi. Hey, Angelica. I'm happy to be here. Hi. Yay. And Cameron Gelman, who plays Rick Tyler, a.k.a. Our Man. What's up, guys? Hey, Cam. Hi, everyone. <laughs> we're going. We're doing well so far. No yeah. <laughs> we'll hope it stays that way. Um, Jeff, let's kick it off with you, um, because I know that this character and story are very personal to you. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for Stargirl and her kind of long journey to the screen? Sure. I mean, uh... My sister passed away um, before I ever got into comic books, uh, Courtney. And um, she was the inspiration for creating Courtney and Stargirl in the first place. And I like I wanted to capture that kind of that endless energy and drive that she had and, and inspire a you know, superhero. I just uh, I got the inspiration from from her attitude. She was the youngest of us, but she was the coolest and uh, and kicked the most ass for sure and never was afraid of anything. And um, uh, and that's where it started, you know, since Stargirl's become her own character, obviously, and grown in the comic books. But the inspiration and the name has always come from from my sister, Court. So when I started this way back when, I always thought it'd be a cool show. But I'm like, wow, if they ever did a show of Stargirl, like we couldn't do the robot. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to make Paddle just drive a car like it was all, all these <laughs> conversations. And now, like with the VFX and everything, you know, it, it felt like everything happens for for a reason and um and it felt like you know this show came together now because we could do it the way we wanted to do it and there were so many talented and amazing people that that worked on it and you know from the first books i did with lee motor and scott collins the artist to, to this it's been a it's been an awesome journey and I'm, i've had so much fun making it with this crew and everybody else it was the best time of my life it really was 
I love it. Um, Breck, let's kick off with you, obviously, as our star girl. What did getting this role mean to you? Because you're a bona fide superhero now. No one can ever take that away from you. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. I feel like my name's on this list that's there forever. I feel like as soon as you're part of like the DC universe, you almost get to make like your mark in history. And it's an honor. Also, like the JSA has been around for decades. And so just getting to be a part of that historic thing, it, it truly is an honor. And I'm once again, like what Jeff said, it was the best experience. It exceeded any expectation that I had. And what kind of uh, training did you do to prepare? Because obviously this is a very physically demanding role. Courtney yeah. has natural ability as well as kind of what's imbued through the staff. So talk us through kind of the preparation for the role. Yeah, so I had a week intensive kind of boot camp where we split the day up between gymnastics training, combat fighting training, and a lot of bow staff training because clearly Star Girl is always has her staff next to her. And that's the part that did not come naturally to me. Like I have a history in gymnastics um, and even like fighting, but I never messed with the staff. So we focused a lot on that. And our, our stunt team was absolutely amazing. Walter Garcia, uh, he was tough on me, but I needed it. And I knew if he gave me a compliment and said I did good, it was honest because he did not beat around the bush. And then also like my stunt double, while I did get to do a lot of stuff, she made Star Girl look so cool. Uh, it was my first time getting to do, like wire work. I'd never done green screen work. So there were a lot of firsts for this in this for me. Yeah. Amazing. Well, the rest of you are also now part of the pantheon of DC legends. Let's go through all of you, talk about your characters. Yvette, we'll start with you because uh, tonight's episode is episode two and we get to see a little bit of all of you, but episode three is an awesome showcase for Yolanda in particular. Episode four. Um, uh, yeah, that's episode four. Yes. Yes, you're right. Sorry. Episode four. Um, so from what we've seen so far, she's been having a rough time at school. Um, so what can you preview about her transformation into Wildcat and maybe why she might have some hesitations about uh, joining this team that, that Courtney will be putting together? Um, I can say that in episode four, you'll find out a lot as to why she is feeling so insecure and guarded and why she's not really um, outspoken. But uh, I don't know, Jeff. How how much can I say on this? Say whatever you whatever you want to say. You can say you know the character. <laughs> really? Okay. I think um, so. I mean, everything. Like I think I think there's something about you know just to tee it up for everybody. I think there's something about becoming this these heroes that certainly for um, and you you can talk about this a bit, but they all becoming these heroes is going to help them or challenge whatever they're dealing with. The whole point of it is that this is going to, you know, either fill a void inside them or challenge that void or challenge who they are. And, and they all need this in their own ways. And they might not even know how they need it. And they, it might lead them down a wrong path and they'll have to get back on the wrong path. But I think if you, you know, if you really look at each one of these characters becoming Stargirl or Wildcat or Our Man or Dr. Midnight, it, it's, it's what these characters are, are missing in their lives. Well put, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> you should talk like, about it too. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Like you're, you're, you're so, you're so brilliant at the. I mean, the scenes in four, like they make me cry every time I watch them. I know. I remember the first time you showed me. It was like I cried again. I always cry though when I see myself cry. So <laughs> <laughs> that means you're a good actress. You're doing it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think there'll be a lot that people are surprised about, especially in her home life, as as much as kind of what she's dealing with at school. I thought that that was really yeah, like it definitely. An aspect. I mean, some of the decisions that she's that she's making, um, it bleeds into her life all around. So so it's really tough. So Wildcat, I mean, Courtney coming at the time that she did, it's almost like a saving grace. She came at the time exactly when I needed her. So you guys will Love see the that. development on that. <laughs> that was it's perfect. That was perfect. Love it. Angelica, um, Beth is so sweet and so earnest, but also a wee little bit socially awkward. Um, so, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about her hero's journey and kind of what it means for her to take up the mantle of Dr. Midnight when that, when that episode rolls around. 
yeah well um that episode will be episode five so that will be really fun for y'all to see um but Beth is, you know, a lot like me. So we definitely have a lot of similarities. Um, her socially awkwardness, she is just so excited about everything, literally everything. So um, she just doesn't really take everyone's cues as well as like Angelica does. So her moments are just, um, it will become really comical because she just, it, Sometimes it just doesn't click. Um, but her hero journey is so beautiful as well because she wants to have friends. She just can't really figure out how to fit in just yet. And so what's beautiful, what you will see is when she does um, eventually join the JSA, I won't tell you how, but when she does, she really starts to um, come more alive because she's found friends. She's found like a family. Um, and in episode two, everyone will be able to meet her family, um, her two parents, which are really exciting. And so they'll kind of see what that dynamic is like with her relationship with her parents and why the JSA is so important to Beth and like why creating this family matters so much to her. Absolutely. And Cameron, um, Rick has um, maybe a little bit of a different motivation um, for wanting to use superpowers. We won't give too much away, but he's he comes at it from a different angle from, from the ladies, I would say. So what should people know about his life so far and how he might uh, feel about being part of this new team? Yeah, um, I think that he is experiencing some of the isolation that, uh, that Ange was just talking about, you know, hers is, is social and maybe his is more familial. Um, but he is also without, um, a community. Um, you know, he, his parents aren't around anymore and he had amazing parents, like no pun intended. He had superhero parents that were so like engaged and a father that felt like he was so invested in Rick's development. And then his life changes so suddenly. And all of a sudden he's living with an uncle who could not care less about him and who is manipulative and, um, and negative and kind of like a force of bad to be around, you know, like a black hole. And so, um, you meet him at a time where he's drowning with his uncle. And then, um, you know, Courtney comes along, who is this like bubbly, positive, um, out of towner, you know, that doesn't really have the right to like be pointing fingers at all these people who have been here about who they are when they don't know themselves, but she does anyway. And it's super um, enticing to Rick to be a part of something again. And so just like Ange, I can't exactly say how he comes to be that. But um, his motivations are the same in that he wants um, he wants to avenge his his parents, you know, just the way that, that the way that Courtney does, you know, with her father. So yeah, yeah, love it. I can't wait to be able to see it. Um, Jeff, this is such a family driven show. All of these guys have kind of touched on it, not just between Courtney and Pat, but you know, the the bonds between parents and kids are explored throughout the JSA and through the Injustice Society, even so. Why do you feel like that is such an important aspect of Stargirl's story? And how do you feel that kind of sets the show apart from maybe other shows and superhero properties we've seen before? Well, the thing I always loved about the JSA, they're so rooted in like World War II in the original 40s. And the legacy, th that, that's why I think that people like seeing them grow and the legacies being passed on. Like it feels natural and organic uh, compared to some superheroes that like Superman keeps moving ahead in time. And I think that's good. Yeah. But I like that the JSA is kind of locked in this, this World War II introduction when they were first introduced. And then you see them pass their legacies on to like, you know, sons and daughters and then other people who take up the mantles. The, that is family, you know, and family legacy is family. And when Lee and I created Courtney, um, I really wanted to see a superhero that wasn't a blood relative pick up the mantle because there were so many like sons and daughters and, I, I really love the idea of a step parent and a step child um, ha forming a bond. And that's where that came from. And so the family family was the very first thing that harkens all the way back to the original Star Spangled Kid in Stripes. He like he driver, but he was more than that. He was like the mechanic and and then he was also kind of the caretaker and part of the family. And so it's always been about family. But because it's 
JSA and Stargirl, and it's all always been about family. And the tone of the books have have been lighter. It, the show was going to be for families, about families, you know, formed and um, and made, and and that's really where we go to. I, I like we gravitated towards, you know, I like that there's stories that tell stories that tell stories that focus on people that are brought together, that come together for whatever reason. Because I think we all we all want to connect with people desperately. And, um, and I think that's, you know, that's what the JSA is all about. That's what legacy is. That's what these stories for people who don't have a good home life, a good family, you got to find family elsewhere. And that's the story of Stargirl, really. I love that. Um, and Brett, having Pat as an older mentor, um, but also as a sidekick of sorts is kind of an unusual twist on the superhero dynamic. So tell us a little bit about finding that kind of exasperated dynamic between Pat and, and Courtney and also what it's like working with the strike robot. Hey, oh, hello. Hey, 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 hey. Hi, so sorry. <laughs> Hi. Amy is smart, everyone. Hey. I'm sorry, my child was having a tantrum. Oh, <laughs> that's all right. New age. New age. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We're very glad you can join us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, anyway, go ahead, Jeff. You were talking. <laughs> oh, no. Laura. <laughs> well, Amy, now that you're here, I can pivot um, to you and we can come back to Brett just so that you will get a chance to um, talk a little bit about the family dynamic that's at the heart of the show, because I think it's such a fascinating and very unique part of Stargirl. Um, and the parents of superheroes don't always have a very easy time uh, in, in comic book history. They're either killed off or, you know, they're the people that the superhero is sneaking around trying to, you know, avoid. Um, so Barbara seems like she's going to be kind of right in the middle of the action um, mm -hmm. through her new job uh, with the American Dream. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how much you're able to tease about her storyline. Uh, throughout the season, <laughs> but it, it seems like uh, Jeff's giving you a lot to work with here. Oh, yes. Well, I think Barbara has such a strong drive to make her family work and to create this new life. And she's kind of left in the dark on, you know, what's really going on. And so from her perspective, I think she's just, you know, knows that it's challenging, knows that it's hard to move to a new town knows that it's hard to make friends and meet new people, but um, also really believes in this small town and the place they grew up and in the people. <laughs> I mean, I think she's, she's such a, a cheerful, optimistic human that, um, that she sees all the opportunities and I don't think she knows any of the true dangers until a little bit later. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so from her perspective, I, you know, I think that she's just really seeing her daughter like this typical teenager who's being a rebellious and pouty and emotional and up and down and not really sure what's going on with her. But, you know, that's teenagers. And um, and then the typical like step, you know, her being a step sister and dealing with that and dealing with a new dad. And so I think she just sort of chalks it up to like you know, kids, life changes, it's just yep. how, it's just what happens. Um, so thanks, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also, think, I, also think, I think Barbara, I think the cool thing about how Amy, how Amy portrays Barbara and what she, she brought to is, you know, she is a mother and a great one. I've seen it in action and she, um, uh, I'm sure the temper tantrum went phenomenal. However, you handled it, I'm sure. I have, yeah. Fine. She's still screaming, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, but I think like you, you bring so much. Um, there is like hope. Like there's like Barbara really wants things to work and and is trying and thinks they can, but knows it's not that easy. And I think Barbara spent in her entire life making sure Courtney was okay, and now Barbara's got a little chance to be okay herself, mm -hmm. and it. I think there's probably a little, you know, there's a, there's a challenge with balancing all that. There's a challenge with, um, with balancing, you know, Courtney's happiness and her own happiness. And now the happiness of, of Pat and Mike, one of my favorite relationships that developed. And it was kind of because of you and Trey, Amy, we're like, uh -huh. <laughs> Amy and like Mike and Barbara really form a great, 
bond over the sea. I, I, it's one of my favorite little stories is what happens between Barbara and, and Mike. Um, that's I'm excited for people to see that develop because it's surprising. Love that. Well, that's a perfect segue for Brent to talk a little bit about Pat and the dynamic between them. It, it worked out great. <laughs> I mean, like you said, it's very unique. Normally, the the dad or the stepdad would be the superhero with the kid being the sidekick. So that alone is like a really fun, funny dynamic. And Luke Wilson, we all know Luke, plays a... Uh, um, that he's so funny just as a person as well. And I give a lot of props to him and that he really just like, let me go for it. And there's so many scenes where he just let me give it to him. Like I got to boss him around and like really push into that funny dynamic. Like there was parts where we would just even like add improv at the end that I felt like helped build that relationship. Uh, I really love episode two though at the end because you know, Courtney, she likes, she likes to push back a lot, but she also does see the good in people and she really sees the goodness in him. He's so good to his mom and to Mike and to her and really cares about all of them. And there's this moment, it's in the trailer where she's like, I, I choose you. And I feel like the, their relationship goes more in that direction throughout the season as well. Love that. Um, Amy, obviously having Courtney and Pat getting along is kind of all she wants, you know, that's yeah. the dream, but they're also keeping the secret from her now. So is that going to cause any strain in either of those relationships? Um, I think it goes through that sort of honeymoon period of like, oh, they're finally getting along. And uh, and this family is going to work. And then they all they both start acting kind of weird. And then it's like this strange suspicion of why are you asking about her right now? Why do you care where she is? What are you hiding? And then there becomes this feeling, this like mama gut feeling of something's not right. I feel like they're holding back and I'm not sure what it is, but I feel like something's off. So that definitely happens. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, for Yvette and Angelica and Cameron, um, we get, we've kind of got to see through promotional stuff a little bit about your costumes. Um, so I'm very curious uh, how you felt when you stepped on set in them and how they kind of inform your performances. Uh, let, you go ahead, Cam. Uh, you go first. You guys, either, <laughs> okay, I'll, yeah, I'll take it. Um, it's crazy. Wearing a super suit is insane. Um, because it's like having a mattress that is wrapped around your body. Um, and uh, that was happening in Stargirl winter in Atlanta summer. Um, and so first off, you're just getting like the benefits of a sauna for 14 hours a day. Um, but then you have what happens to you posturally. Like I slouch and I think I made the choice like Rick is someone that does that as well because there's not confidence there, right? And then all of a sudden you put on a suit that makes you so upright. And I think it added height for me. Um, and it was, um, it was different than how I normally stand. And so that was slightly uncomfortable. But then for me, that felt like, okay, Rick is uncomfortable wearing a suit that he hasn't earned. He's wearing a suit that his father wore and his father was a better man than he is and was of more integrity. And so all of those things made it kind of my favorite thing. Like putting it on was a very sacred process. I had the same two wonderful guys helping me put it on every day. And I was very stubborn about that because, you know, superheroes have to be able to put their suits on themselves. Um, and it was a lot of pieces, but it was really like extraordinary to wear it and felt like an honor. And it wasn't something you just popped into. So when it was time to wear it, it was like time to get yourself ready mentally and step up and really think about what that meant. So I loved it. It's a gorgeous suit and the details are just like unbelievable. LJ Shannon designed the super yeah. suits and she just, she is the best. She is the best in the business. So hi LJ, if you're out there. Thank you. <laughs> and that, what about you? For me, it just felt so surreal stepping on set and knowing that this is my job. Like <laughs> this is my job. I get to, and you feel the, when I stepped on set and there, there's just this different, um, I just felt like everyone noticed it, you know, everyone noticed me and my 
in my cat suit, obviously. It was the first time stepping on. So I don't know. It was it was really fun. It was really fun. Uh, the process, it, it in the beginning, it took like 20 minutes to put my cat suit on, my wild cat suit on. And then slowly we got a rhythm of putting it on faster just because, like Cam said, we did have the same two people helping us over and over again. But, yeah, it was like a dream come true. I've always wanted to play a superhero. So when the time came to finally do it, it was crazy. It was the best It was the best thing ever. So, um, yeah, and also with, with Wildcat's movements and everything, I just remember – you asked how, how it puts you into character. It, I was kind of learning um, while I was going with it because, you know, playing an animal, I felt like, well, an animal, yeah, a wildcat. It, it just felt like I needed to do certain things differently. You know, there are stances and everything that the stunt team taught us. So it was just me learning with it. So it was a great experience and, and it was so fun. Amazing. Angelica, what about you? Uh, I love, love, love my super suit. I, just as everyone else does. I think there is, um, kind of what you saying, w w there's like, when you're doing scenes, like regular high school scenes, those are awesome. But when we're in our super suits, it's a different energy. It's a different vibe that's on set. Like everyone feels like, oh my gosh, we're doing this. Like we're superheroes. We're like really saving the world. I think that's, what's really fun is like, we all really believe it. I think that's what's going to make our series um, really stand out and it's just going to make it even better because we were really believing all of it. Um, I am so, so happy that Jeff and everyone chose to have the original Dr. Midnight suit for myself. Um, I think that that's super special. I love that I get to wear like the original Dr. Midnight suit and it, they are extremely hot and really heavy and it's really awesome. But I think when I used to think superheroes before, I just used to think, oh, I don't know, it's just like this really cool suit. You don't really think about eventually like, oh, there's layers, like, oh, this <laughs> is heavy and it's hot, but it's like the heavy, hot seriousness that like almost helps the scene. Cause then you're like, you have that, that energy. Um, but I feel like we would take the heavy, the heaviness and the heat in Atlanta in the summer, every summer for the rest of our lives, if we could. So we're just so grateful that we get to wear the suit and we don't take any of it for granted. Um, we wear it with so much pride and we're just so grateful we get to tell this awesome story. Yeah. Laura. What about you, bro? Yes. Can I ask Ange one question? Yeah. Yes. Ange, how is your cape? <laughs> I wanted to bring the cape up. Wait, wait, can I specify that? How okay. is the cape walking downstairs? <laughs> it's <laughs> choking. Is what it is. I really hope that one day we release the blooper reel because the amount of times I get stepped on is just unreal. Every well, time I'm the I character, to... yeah, yeah I know. because the fun part about it was because like she's wearing <laughs> literally wearing Charles McNider's suit, and we wanted the cape long, so she's awkward. Like it's not that easy, and you know, and it's like she's she's taking on a legacy that is challenging in every possible way, including a really long cape. <laughs> including it but i'll take it like day. a bridal train yep like, just have them all carry it behind you <laughs> right wait I, they, I think they even had to cut it a little bit didn't they because it was just that long was yeah, that yeah, you know oh wait inches it was like it was it was dragging to the point where like every time we did a scene it was like i just kept falling back <laughs> because i was being stepped on but it because it's really funny when you, when you watch i do it. think it like <laughs> added something to beth chapel like i feel like our suits individually add something to each of our characters yeah, even the cape, like making it you uncoordinated. Then you have this sure. thing where Rick is always charging ahead because he has to be first, and Beth is the smart one, so she steps up. And we would like charge at a door to like solve the problem, and I would just demolish her cape in my <laughs> massive boots, and then Ange would fall into the door. And then it was always a question of like, in one second, are we going to stay with this? And like, I would laugh and ruin it, but Ange would stay with it. <laughs> and yeah. No, I feel very spoiled with with my super suit because it didn't have layers. Um, the fabric, like, I don't know if you can tell, but LJ, she really is the best. Like, each fabric was a different star pattern, and that's how it created that, like, beautiful depth. Um, so the fabrics were custom-made, but they are thick. So even with my, like, 
little two piece. I still got hot. So I cannot imagine what they have. So I felt very spoiled. And I do have to say, I was grateful because it was also very functional. Like the shoes were really comfortable. Going back to what Cam said, it changed my posture. Like I like to say, it's like, oh, when I have my super suit on, I just like become star girl and I just stand up straight. But in reality, like I can't slump even if I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> But it is like, I, I am so grateful for it. it. Every time I put it on, I truly felt like a superhero. And I remember episode five, it was the first time, like the JSA, excluding Pat, because we hadn't told him yet. We were keeping it a secret. But uh, we were all together in our super suits in the basement. And just the energy that we felt all being together for the first time. Uh, I'll remember that forever. Like five, it, it just felt like team togetherness. And that's what Star Girl's about. I love that. And I'm so glad you brought up the, uh, the star pattern because I was going to say there's such attention to detail in all of these costumes. I was wondering if there were any little details like that that maybe don't even show up on the screen, but you guys know about um, that, that kind of stand out for you about your costumes, a little favorite thing about any LJ, of them. LJ put a pattern in every single one of these, and like Star Girl has the stars. There's little hourglasses and Rick's costume. Yeah. I don't Mine have the know. scratches. I have little scratches yeah. on. Yeah, there's everything. Had Mine it. have little moons everywhere. And I, I like that. She, like LJ would take Doctor Midnight's, and we talked about it. And she would, um, her and her team made it very medieval, like leathers, and you know, it just feels a little more throwback because that's who he is. Uh, it, it was it, there was a lot of thought that went into these. these oh suits. my gosh! But with Ange wearing those goggles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Those How goggles. many times did they fog up and you were like, ah, I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> they even had the special right. lenses, right? The special yeah. lenses so they wouldn't fog up. Yes. Yeah. They were even. called no lenses eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were. They were. They so like, what would have been later? A CGI. Yeah. We all had a troubleshoot. We all had one thing that kept happening, right? Like, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you had that. Yeah. That, the hourglass kept moving around. Yeah, the hourglass hit me in the face every time I ran. Oh, when, when Breck thought she broke the hourglass that one day? I did, did break, break the hourglass. She did okay. break the hourglass. <laughs> yeah. She didn't think. We had a couple. That's why. Oh, wait, Breaks it did break? Yeah, yeah, I have a photo of it. It's just like sitting on the concrete with all the dust everywhere. And I'm like, <laughs> I just remember being like, Simon, I did something <laughs> bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she did break so it. Funny. Yeah, every costume had its challenges. Okay. Glamorous life of being a superhero. This is the real stuff. This is what people don't realize. Yeah. Hey, you work hard for it. <laughs> um, Jeff, I know that you've obviously uh, tweaked the Starman mythology a little bit for the show, but um, I also believe that you have a whole backstory figured out for the kind of superhero history on Earth 2, um, predecessors of the JSA. Is there anything that you can preview about what we might learn about the JSA um, and, um, and who preceded them potentially? Well, one of the other writers uh, that works on the show with us is James Robinson, who is one of my very favorite people in the world. And um, uh, he's a, one of my favorite comic writers. I've known him since I was 19 when I met him at a show as a fan. And he and I talk a lot about the, the mythology because we both love the JSA. And, you know, you want to celebrate. It started in the 40s. And in the show, it started in the 40s to us. And then it moved forward. Um, but we stick pretty close, like we delve into the, the the lore, we stick pretty close as the season goes on and we go to some unexpected places, uh, particularly with Pat and his history with Star Spangled Kid, which is a lot of fun. We go to some, you know, if you're, if you really love the D DC universe and you're a hardcore fan, we do like really, really deep cuts into these characters. Um, I never had the really chance like. to write Yolanda or Beth in the comic books because the characters were they were killed off like in the, in the 90s before i got into comics so but we're here now but we're here now yeah and it's and i think it's great to bring some of these characters you know back uh but it's it's we're taking a lot of cues from the comics you know the stuff that i wrote that james wrote that roy thomas wrote it's all it's all pretty heavily in there and i think people will be surprised as as the mythology and the story unfolds to see how true we are to the characters in fact, tonight we mentioned uh, a little bit about the star, star um, the cosmic staff, and we have a bunch of stories for where that came from, who held it before Sylvester, and all that too. So it's all we coming like up. Not coming. We up. love that. <laughs> um, one of the best things about 
the show, I think, is that, at least for fellow nerds, I think, is that it really rewards comic fans who are paying attention. There are so many little Easter eggs and outright references. There were things that I blinked and missed in the first episode that when I rewatched, I was like, oh my God, that's someone who I won't mention in case other people haven't, but like, it all, it all comes about. Um, but um, can you guys tell us a little bit about your favorite Easter eggs or um, have any that you want to highlight that people might want to watch out for as, as we go along? I have a question. So I yes. saw someone, they were like, you know, when Courtney looks up into the stars and they twinkle before yeah. she finds the cosmic staff. There, someone was like, there's 14 stars. Does it represent the 14 members of the JSA? Does it, or was that just like coincidence? Uh, that's not about the number the number of members in the JSA, but it's about something else that we'll get into. Ooh. Well, my favorite Easter egg is when um, Courtney, your sister, and Breck are in a picture together. I think I brought it up to you. Yeah, they're they're in a picture in the first episode. So yeah. cute. Yeah, that's a nice one. Doug Madison, our prop master, did that. That was super nice of him to do. I had never seen a photo of of Courtney actually until that was pointed out. That was really an amazing touch. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, Doug's Doug's an awesome guy. He he did all our props. Him and Simon and the team, amazing prop team. They were so good, so nice to work with, so passionate. They were, I mean they they built the staff. This they built this. I was going to say, we should talk a little bit about this really badass right. staff you just yeah. have chilling. Yeah, this one doesn't light up, but, you know. <laughs> um, oh, you're beautiful. a star like, girl. It may. The detail is so wonderful. <laughs> captured. Wow. Really captured. My, one of my, the coolest things about the staff to me was they made different versions of it in that, like, the material was different. So they had one that was, like, more susceptible to the stunts where it was made of rubber, I want to say. And yep. that one's more, like, a hard like pla not plastic i don't know what it is but you cannot tell the difference like if you put the rubber one next to the more legit one they look the exact same and that was so amazing to me i think it was cool too josh stern our gaffer created this um the light rod um that is just a, a tube with light in it but it's controlled by remote control it can light up bright it can light from one end it can move around and and he really designed that thing it's a genius you know, it's genius that he did that. So that all the light flow on everyone's faces whenever they interacted. I was going to say, it would be so cool. difficult to, oh, you know, you can't have see, see that light. Stuff. No. Yeah. Andrew Orloff, um, who heads up Zoic and, uh, and did the VFX. He, we had a lot of discussions with everybody about how do you do the staff? So it, it, it feels real. And there were talks about like, let's put some lights on the back of this. And it just was never, it was going to always look really not not great so we had versions of the staff that would light up and then we'd replace the whole staff so that the glow of the light would be would be real and we had all sorts of like walter garcia i know that mentioned him but he, our stunt coordinator and second unit director he they had to build stunt staffs that gl that would glow and amy had a great scene with a bunch with this a couple of stunt staffs and they toward the end of this the pilot that's really fun that i'm excited for people to see everybody had to work with the staff on some level Everyone here. Mm. So it's really cool to see Breck in particular learn this skill set of how to interact with the staff as if it was a real character. That took a little while, like for all of us to figure out. We didn't, it took a while until we saw the pilot come together. Like, oh, wow, the staff really is a big character in the show. And it, and it continued to get bigger as we went. Yeah. Jeff was constantly having to remind me, like, Breck, remember that staff is moving. It's like reacting to things. It's, it, it's really heavy. Remember, it's like, so I, it did take me time to learn that. But by the end, like I would even highlight every time the staff was mentioned, almost as if I was like highlighting the staff's lines because it, it is a character. Oh yeah. At some point we were filming, I think this was a little later in the season. It might have been episode five. And this was my first time really interacting with the staff. And it was the same thing, just kind of a process of figuring out like it was very in my face. And I remember I smacked it <laughs> one time. And I think, Jeff, I think you came in and you were like, people already don't like Rick. Like if you hit it, it's just like a real problem because it's like a living. So like, yeah, let's yeah. just tone it down. <laughs> yeah, I was like, just swat at it. Like, just yeah, just swat. dodge it. But don't hit it. Don't hit it. <laughs> Jeff, you kept everything. It was amazing for Jeff because he was on set almost every single day of filming the show. 
And I thought, I think you kept the storylines and the relationships so on point to the point where, cause you have a new director coming in each time that, that they don't fully get the world or how people interact. And I just feel like, for example, there was one scene where I'm dealing with one of the characters, God, I don't want to give anything away. And, but we thought, oh, they would give a friendly hug. And she goes, they would never touch. <laughs> do you remember when yeah, Neil comes in I, and you were like, no, yeah. they don't touch. I do remember. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's too, that crosses the line. Yes. Yeah, you were so good at like really being so specific about how they interacted and what crossed what lines. So yeah. getting back to like, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't touch the staff that way, Cam. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there's like, you know, it's when we're all working together to find the show, you know, we're all finding the characters together. We're finding the show together. You know, we had amazing people on the show. Like it was a team effort, everybody. And I, everybody brought such a nice energy to it, which was, I really appreciated that this whole cast is like, they came in and they, they killed it every day. It was awesome. I love that. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the visual effects. I know we've kind of touched on it here and there, but can you talk us through the process a little bit, Jeff, in terms of how it differs from, from some of the other superhero shows? And sure. uh, for all of the cast, maybe you can share your favorite visual effect moment, whether it's the staff or something else, something from the season that you're excited for people to see. Sure, I'll be really brief so I don't bore everybody about the technical de details of it all. But I uh, think it's fascinating. But you know, because we had digital characters like Stripe and Solomon Grundy and the staff, there's there's a different element to the show, and we really wanted to. Glenn Winter, who directed the pilot, when we talked about it, we really wanted to make this feel like the movies that were inspiring to it, like Back to the Future and ET. We wanted to feel like, you know, a really emotional story about a about a young you know, young teenager, but wrapped in genre. Like, that's why I loved Back to the Future. That's why I loved, you know, that's why I loved um, uh, E.T. because it took time travel, it took aliens, and it made it, it made it, it made it more emotional. Um, and it made it for everybody, not just genre fans. And taking superheroes and trying to do that in the same way, we wanted it to look and feel more like a, a throwback to those movies, but also be firmly set in 2020. And to do that beyond using, you know, shot choice and, and pacing was really VFX and our action. And so we employed um, something that we don't, they don't usually do on shows. We use this company called Third Floor, which created previs for us. So it's like animatics storyboards before we shoot everything. And Third Floor would allow us to watch the action scene before we even shot a single frame. And we'd be able to adjust it with the, working with the directors adjust the action sequence and then show like everybody on set what this was going to be and if it had stunts walter would shoot the stunt previous and we'd intercut it but we could watch that opening scene in the mansion from the moment pat breaks through the gates until the moment starman dies it was completely prevised so that we could we could alter it and change it and then ultimately shoot it all shot for shot and edit it it was sim simple to put it together but it allowed us to efficiently budget and schedule these bigger action scenes. So when it came to VFX, that was it. And then our VFX house, I have to give them a massive shout out again, is Andrew Orloff who co-founded co and co-runs Zoic. He was our point person and I met with a lot of VFX houses and they were the ones that came in and said, here's what we're gonna do. And they they really showed all these examples of what the staff could do. And um, and they really just developed like a whole language at the beginning. They, they, re they really put everything into it. And I said to Andrew, well, who, who's our point person when we talk to you guys about VFX? He said, me, I want to make this the best thing we've ever done. And, and, that, and they did. They, they did an amazing job. I can't wait for people to see every, all the VFX beyond what we, we, we did. But it was, a, it was a team effort between you know, the writers, the directors, the, the third floor previs, Walter, um, Andrew and Zoic, like everybody worked really hard but having this initial third floor animatic to work off of and walter's stunt viz to work off of in combination that's really how we were able to do some some pretty i think interesting and 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 you know raise the bar if you want to say like we tried to raise the bar like the opening of two for those who haven't seen it tonight like that opening is nuts you know with stripe and everything so um, but that's how we employed the, the VFX and everyone worked on it. Like I talked about the staff, like Josh Stern and, and, and I mean, there were so many Kevin Struckman, who was our, um, VFX supervisor on set. There were so many talented people that were a part of 
trying to make the show look as good as it could possibly look. Succeeded with flying colors, I think. So for the cast members, uh, what was your favorite uh, visual effects moment or a, a particular green screen uh, moment that uh, really stands out to you from season one? As I said, I love the opening of episode two for like a particular like green screen visual effect shot. The thing I just love is when Stripe puts his hand down and I climb up it because on the day I was literally climbing up these black ugly poles like it almost looked like a playground of poles I don't know and I remember Greg Beeman he was our director he was trying to be so specific he's like and then seeing it I grew up loving Iron Giant and it just gives me Iron Giant vibes so definitely I love that moment we love Iron Giant Iron Giant like obviously influencing Stripe Iron Giant Frankenstein Jr this old cartoon I remember watching as a kid about a kid and a robot all that stuff Love that. Cameron, what about you? Um, so this is specific to VFX, right? That means things that were edited. Like it's not, that's different than like punching things on set, right? And then break. <laughs> well, it depends. <laughs> like some of the things you punch were both yeah. VFX and practical. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm just, that's what I'm, I mean, thinking about is like, I don't know. I'm going to stop. Um, the, yeah, it's hard to talk about some of the stuff because of spoilers. I know yeah, what Cam's favorite like, moment is. I know what Cam's. I know, yeah. I know um, what Cam's favorite moment is for CG. <laughs> it's a big um, spoiler. I'll say. What, I mean, what Breck said. Like, I, I, I truly like. am obsessed with Iron Giant, and um, and then there was like a Hugh Jackman movie that was like the the next version of that, the Real Steel or something. Real like. Steel. And Robots yeah. fight. I just think it's awesome. And then like meeting Stripe. And then understanding that the, that Stripe was going to be fighting with us and seeing it happen for the first time, like that was what made me go like, oh my gosh, our show is like setting a new precedent for for effects because I knew the I like uh, the, the cast is amazing and the writing is amazing. So like all that stuff was there and I'd seen people's scenes and whatever, but I hadn't seen Stripe yet. And then seeing like Courtney ride Stripe was just like game over for me. I was like, okay. Everything from here on out is gonna it's gonna be good. So, yeah. One of my favorite special effects um, was how they. I mean, it. They showed it in the preview, so I don't think it's a spoiler. But when uh, Wildcat, when she does climb on the wall, the just the way they do it, it's like a flat surface, and then on screen or how, whenever they edit it, they flip it to make it look like I was up this huge building. But I mean, I do have to go on wires. Sometimes I'm not gonna say anything. Sorry, but all good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, my favorite. Honestly, it's a little more simple, but to see Courtney with the staff and doing your gymnastics and flying around, it just has the most like fantastical sort of like I want to be doing that. <laughs> I like that yeah. word fantastical. Me it too. just feels so like. It so, looks so so much fun, and I also did not expect you to have such a fun relationship with the staff because yeah. I didn't see any of really her filming the staff stuff. And for it's like I feel like in a weird way I keep thinking it's like your little pet dog that's like come on, eat. Yeah. and I love that it has a personality, which again I didn't know it had a, its own personality. So to me, that's that is so much fun to see. Brock, you did such a good job giving it a personality because it was just a stick and it didn't do anything. And she was the one who was like, you know, shaking it. It was so cute watching her because eventually it did become real to her. It seemed like we had so many episodes. Of and then by the end, I felt almost more confident than when they would put the staff in my hand. It was like a comfort blanket almost. I was like, oh, I have my buddy with me. When she would put it down sometimes too, she'd be like, okay, I'm going to set you here. You know, she'd actually start to laugh. It was so okay, now I'm sounding crazy. No, uh, it was for, for the show. I want to give mad props real. Angelica to, for the work that she did with Dr. Midnight and the goggles because like, oh, yes. she talked to herself on set for hours oh, at a time. <laughs> With no, like, with an AD speaking back. And then when I saw episode five, which, you know, uh, Ange and I are very much in that one, like, it's that relationship is so clear as well. And everything from eye lines to 
like the specific reactions that, you know, when, when McNider speaks back to her, like it's crazy how, how accurate she was with that and how personified that is. And I just thought it was amazing because I stayed and watched a lot of those scenes and I think it's nearly impossible to convincingly talk to nothing. And it seemed like you're engaging in a conversation. So, Thanks, Cam. Yeah. I appreciate that. I was just going to say, my obviously, like I'm biased, but my favorite visual effects is definitely my goggles. I think um, Beth's goggles, I mean, they mean everything to her, so they mean everything to me. And so I just love, love, love my goggles. Whenever I get to have them, um, they kind of have a mind of its own too. I like that I get to talk. I mean, I, I, yeah, talk to myself, I hear myself and it's really great and get to see things that aren't there, but they're there, you know? And so it's really, really fun. And I think it's going to be really cool when everyone sees it. Um, I did get to see episode five as well. And I'm so grateful that it turned out well, because when you're doing it as you're acting, you're just like, I hope everyone can see what I'm seeing in my head. And so it's really cool to see the effects of how everyone can see what I'm seeing. Um, and I think like, I love the coloring, like the green, everything, it just comes alive, it comes alive so much. And so really excited about that. I love that. I was going to say, if I could have any of the abilities on the show, I think the goggles are kind of the most useful slash cool. Like you just get to know <laughs> all this, all this stuff about people. And it's just very <laughs> handy for like blackmail purposes. Or I don't know, like, <laughs> yeah. very, just seem very useful in a lot of different ways. Um, I want to get to some fan questions from Twitter that people have sent. Um, so we have one from Stargirl Sense. I'm very sorry if I'm butchering names here. Um, for each of you, what was your favorite fight scene to do, which we might have touched on a little bit, so I know if you can't go into spoilers, then that's totally fine. Um, and what are you most excited for fans to see in regards to each of your characters? I'm going to start with Breck and just go down the... Um, this is so in the comics, and there's a little glimpse of it in the trailer, so whatever. I really enjoyed one of the two fight scenes I have with Shiv. I think they're awesome and a really cool dynamic. Um, I'm most excited for fans to see the JSA come together and just team up. Like there's that iconic shot in the crisis on infinite earths and that's in our show as well. And just us standing there with stripe behind us assembled. Yeah. My favorite one, my favorite fight sequence was the one that sh showed in the trailer where we all just kind of jump at each other. It was insane. And then when it was all cut together, like like Brett touched on Walter Garcia, he did amazing with coordinating that whole stunt mm -hmm. choreography. It was my favorite. Can I say what episode that is? No, I can't. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to. Not going yes. to. <laughs> Just blink a certain number of times. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> I have a favorite fight scene, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, Jeff. I, think I know your favorite fight scene. It's a spoiler. <laughs> Big time, yeah. but it's a good yeah. fight scene. It's a really good fight scene. Again, game. Walter Garcia, amazing. Yeah, I mean, I love that you get to do fight scenes. That's it's to know that I, I is coming at some point. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, Cameron. Oh, okay. Um, it's kind of the same thing where it's as everyone where it's like spoilery, kind of, but yeah, I don't know. I mean. I, I, I know what you're going to say. Don't uh, say yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Go with you know, the exactly what you're most excited for fans to say. So look, all I can, all, what I can say about it is that very far down our journey, like th there gets to be like a tremendous release in the form of a fight for Rick that is so pent up through uh, near misses the entire season. Um, and he's so restrained by his team who are trying to get him to think logically. And when you finally see that like ripped open, it's like a Hulk smash moment and it's nuts. Um, yeah. So that's like our man unleashed. And, and that's definitely far and away, like my favorite. So. Love that. I would say that my favorite fight scenes, um, I'd agree with everything everyone else has said. Um, I got to, we, Sidebar, what I think is so great about this cast and um, this opportunity of this series is that we would literally show up to set to watch each other's fight scenes that we were not in. Like we would not be filming that day and we're like, hey, let's go to set so we can watch so-and-so's fight scene because we just are like, 
I feel like just so um, inspired by everyone. And we in literally enjoy watching each other work. Like I enjoy watching Breck with her staff. And obviously she got to use that a lot in the beginning episode. So watching her interact with um, and like an item may help me with my goggles, right? So, so many of those things are helpful. Um, but watching the ISA and the JSA, I mean, I'm just going to leave that there because that, is where the money is. Right? I mean, even even Luke on his days off would show up on set, just wander on, wander on set, and yeah. hang out. It was so just cool. So fun. Wandered is the perfect way to describe. <laughs> yeah. Luke and just, yeah, yeah, just wander around. It's Wandering, it's great. I love that. Jeff, um, what's yours? I'm curious. Yeah. Mine? Oh, the hard one. I really. I don't know. Emotional. I mean, I know I don't want to spoil it. Uh, <laughs> I like it when the emotions backing the fight. Right. And I think one of the things we all worked really hard, we had a wonderful writer's room, wonderful group of directors, um, Leah Thompson, Jennifer Fang, like Greg Beeman, so many great directors that worked on this, but, um, and, and I would say like the thing that I, I really, uh, I'm anxious and excited for Bill to see just that the fights are motivated by emotion, by the characters. They're not just, we don't just do fight scenes to do fight scenes. Sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't. And we try to really make them locked into character and grounded in the character, motivated by character. And that's, that's the, so I'm excited for people to see that, but I'm, the one I'm thinking of is very emotional for Courtney and it's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, Jeff, this next one is for you from Jimmy. Given that Stargirl is set on Earth 2, will there be any winks or nods to the larger Arrowverse or will it be like Black Lightning and be its own thing? until the time is right if the time comes to cross over? Um, both. Like, we really want to make sure our 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 show is established, Earth 2 is established, the tone of the show, the characters. But, you know, the multiverse exists, you know, for a, for a reason. Like, eventually, if it makes sense, and when the time is right and the story is right, most, most importantly, when the story is right, yeah. In the comics, Earth 2 crossed over to the other worlds, but it's, it's all, you know, we want to make sure we firmly establish our show, but absolutely like at some point we'll want to do something. That makes sense. Uh, a related one from Miss Glitter 1888 is Courtney's timeline before or after crisis on infinite earths. Uh, is the new earth two like we saw at the end of crisis or is this the old earth two before it was destroyed by the anti-monitor? Post crisis earth two. I'll answer that question for everybody. I knew it. I knew the answer though. I was like, oh. You did? Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So they, you know, they had all these, they have all these shows. They had a big crossover and then they, at the end, they destroyed all the other Earths. And then at the end, they, re they, they rebirthed all these parallel Earths. And we are the new Earth too, which in the comic books is perfect because that's where the JSA and the Seven Souls of Victory are from. So we have our own little world to play in. And our own temp, you know, our own tone to that world too, because Earth Two is a little bit of a throwback world, even though it's modern day. I love that. Um, for all of the cast from Our Lazier, did you read the comics, or did you prefer to create your own versions of the characters separate from the already established versions of them? If you want to start with Breck and go down the line. I did read a couple of the Stars and Stripes just so I would be knowledgeable, but I mean the writing of our of our scripts i feel like is so specific and so well informed that i felt like i could find my own version through just the scripts alone um i did not i know star girl has been in two other dc shows in the past just as little small pieces and i did not watch those because just even looking at pictures they looked like uh more mature well seasoned versions of star girl and this is her finding the staff kind of the start of Stargirl. So I really didn't want to watch those for reference. Uh, I can agree. I can say that I, um, like Breck, I, of course I knew of Dr. Midnight and um, her and Infinity, Infinity, Infinity Inc. and just other comics. Um, but I didn't, I tried not to go back and read too much because I wanted to really make my Beth Chapel my Beth Chapel, um, and I didn't want my brain to kind of see that version and think I had to do that. If that makes sense. Um, I really wanted to keep her in high school, right, because that's where she's at, and um, and have her own world with her friends and have her own new experiences. And I think the moment I found out that I had the original Dr. McNighter suit, I felt a lot more confident to not necessarily do as much crazy research on. Um, 
both of the Dr. Midnight's. And so I kind of like blend and make my own. So with me, I know that Yolanda, she's a reporter in the comics and it's a little different from how it's being portrayed in our show. So I didn't really follow a certain outline on it as how the comics did it. I just did my own version. Um, yeah, she's in high school here and in the comics, she's a little older. So I just decided to put my own, put my own truth in it. Um, I feel like I probably drove you bonkers, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he just nods. <laughs> you didn't drive me bonkers. No, it was good. You're like, there are a lot of questions and discussion, but it was a very specific, like yeah. I've written, I've written Rick Tyler in the comic books for a long, long time. I love that character. Rick yeah, and, and you were super gentle about it because I feel like it was just like even if he had been on set the entire day and then flown to Burbank to edit and then come back to write, I would just like walk into his office and be like, "Here's a hundred questions, Jeff." Um, but that was my process. I I wanted to like read everything, kind of make that big list, and then just see if anything stuck out to me. You know, like if there were any ins that were specific or that affected me. Um, Knowing that I was a legacy, it was just super important to me to understand like my family and my father. And because comics are so vast and because the universe is reset in different universes, Rick Tyler had different relatives sometimes. And just I wanted to clear that stuff up because learning that I was alone with my uncle, I wanted to know, like, does Rick have anyone else or is he stuck here? And so those kinds of things really helped me just put blinders on and then do my own thing. But at first, I, I had a lot of questions. Well, um, it's, it's tricky. It's like, I mean, even with, with like <laughs> with with Barbara, Rick, Yolanda, Beth and, and Courtney, all of it, like we try and take the writers like we had Melissa Carter and James Robinson and Colleen McGinnis and Taylor and Paul and Robbie, all of them. We all tried to funnel that comic book stuff into the scripts. And because there are so many different versions of all these characters in the comic books and in other media that you need to help, you need to help everybody find, find kind of the, the lane we're playing in. And then they make that their own because there are so many different versions of Rick, like in the con there, that's why Cam would call, wait, I read this story. Wait, I read this story and they contradict each other because these characters aren't as, you know, solidified and, and, and like, like they haven't, they haven't solidified in, in a way where they're, they don't change still in the books. So we had to all find our own, our own, their own voices. The and it was really nice having Jeff there because he basically is a walking DC encyclopedia. <laughs> any question about any character and he'll have every single version of every single answer. Um, so as we did our fair share of research, we, we, we really didn't need to because we had Jeff there. <laughs> if I wasn't there, James was there. <laughs> so That's it was so true, <laughs> right? To like, I mean, James, yeah, it's, it was, it was fun to have it, have all that knowledge, but we really have to funnel it through character because, you know, and, and you mentioned Easter eggs, like every little Easter egg we have, if you want to call them that, everything's a story. Everything leads to a story. We didn't just like throw a prop in there because we thought the prop was cool. We have a story for everything, everything, every character name we drop, every prop you see, we have a story idea to do something with it. I'm so excited to see where it goes. I cannot wait. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for. I am so sorry to cut you guys off. I feel like we could talk for hours and hours about this amazing show. But thank you guys so much for being with us. Thank you guys at home for watching. Uh, remember to tune in for the new episode tonight at 8, 7 central on the CW or watch it tomorrow on the CW app. Uh, new episodes are available Mondays on DC Universe and Air Tuesdays on the CW, so you have no excuse not to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. So fun. So happy to see y'all. Yeah, thanks for watching.